I think the areas where we can develop consensus are the areas where it's the most long-lasting because if there isn't consensus around it, when the other side comes in, they'll get rid of it. They'll just they'll throw it away. Hey folks, and welcome back to Prognosis Ohio. I'm Dan Skinner, and that was John Corlett of the Center for Community Solutions, who's our guest today. Before turning to my conversation with John, just a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss future episodes. Consider sharing them with your friends and colleagues. And if you like what you hear, please help us to make more by throwing us a few bucks through our Patreon account, which you can find at prognosisohio.com. We'd really appreciate it. Today's guest is someone I've admired for a long time. As listeners know, we've been lucky to have some of the smart folks from the Center for Community Solutions on this show over the past few years, and I hope that's going to continue far into the future. Today, we're lucky to be able to hear from John Corlett, President and Executive Director of Community Solutions, who's had a distinguished career in human service and health work here in Ohio, including major roles at Metro Health in Cleveland and as our state's Medicaid director during the Strickland administration. John's going to be stepping down from his role at Community Solutions in a few months, so we thought it'd be a great opportunity to not only reflect on what he's learned about Ohio over the last bunch of decades, but to give some time to some issues he's been working on of late. As always, we've got a bunch of links and background info on our show notes, so be sure to check those out. Okay, now to my conversation with John Corlett. John Corlett, thanks so much for being on the show. It's great to have you here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so first off, at the risk of starting with some inside baseball, I want to thank you and CCS for being such fantastic friends of this show. We've benefited from, you know, the expertise and the passion you all bring to the work you do uh, in Northeast Ohio, especially, but also around the state. So thank you. Well, I appreciate that. And we appreciate the work that you do um, because we are very interested in supporting discussion around the kinds of issues and topics that you address on this show. There are some big picture questions I want to get to, but first I want to start with some kind of specifics, um, some projects you're engaged with. We've been lucky enough on this show to have Mike Corey of the Human Service Chamber of Franklin County on. So our listeners are well aware of all that an organization like that brings to a place like Central Ohio. But I know you've been working on establishing a Northeast Ohio Human Services Chamber. So I, I want to ask you, why is that needed now uh, and and how kind of in in terms of the actual work it does, do you see it promoting some of the health objectives that have really framed your career and things you've been involved with for a long time now? Well, we're we're great admirers of Mike and the Human Services Chamber down here in Franklin County. So, yeah, we've been watching him for a while and uh, have wanted to sort of build off of his example in Greater Cleveland. You know, I think there's probably three reasons for me that I think, one, I'll share a story that really crystallized for me why I thought it was important. Uh, but the other was just in general. I mean, we are human service organizations and health organizations are a significant part of the economy in Northeast Ohio and Greater Cleveland. In fact, I'd say we're one of the most important uh, because by supporting us, you we do well and we do good uh, together. And I think that's a powerful combination. Um, and, and so we know of our sort of kind of what we sort of comprise in terms of the economic uh, weight of the community in terms of how significant we are. Uh, we also know we do important work, uh, work that sometimes gets overlooked um, or doesn't get credit or attention. Uh, so I think there's that as well, just trying to educate people about the important role that human service organizations play in Northeast Ohio and in, and in the state, I would say. But the example that sort of crystallized for me why we needed an organization like this, uh, the last state capital budget about two years ago, um, some parties got together uh, in Northeast Ohio to kind of develop a community list of what were the most important projects. Uh, and it you know got sign off from all the state you know the local elected officials, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, and I guess I was stunned when I looked at the list and didn 't see a single human service project on that list because I knew about all sorts of projects that human service groups uh, were trying to get attention for that mm-hmm. you know also contribute to the vitality of of greater Cleveland and so for me, that was when 
you know, we need a countervailing political force, an advocacy force, uh, small p politics, yeah. uh, to sort of make sure that we're take accounted for. And we saw, you know, in, in real bright display during the pandemic, the early months, especially where all these organizations were doing all of this work. And you can kind of realize just the power of the resources, the assets we have, but also something like a human services chamber can bring them together. I mean, you need people to work together. Absolutely. I mean, you know, that, I think that's one of the things I've been struck by as I've talked to, you know, organizations, human service and health organizations in greater Cleveland is they want to work together. They realize, you know, the importance of that, you know, during the pandemic, um, it was often human service organizations that were still open. They were still providing services. The greater Cleveland food bank, during the darkest days of the pandemic was still distributing food to people, emergency food. It was, and it was more important than ever. So they didn't close. They didn't go away. Most of them remained open and a lot of them remained open in person because their services were so important. Well, it's something like a pandemic is precisely when we need those organizations to be at their best in a way, which is a little bit of a paradox because staying open was really hard. Yeah. I, you know, I remember I said to the food bank, I said, you didn't run away from danger. You ran straight into it. Yeah. And and not everybody does that. And not everybody has that kind of, that sort of mission uh, uh, inside of them. Yeah. Well, that, that's interesting. So, so in terms of that project, I mean, um, how do you actually go about establishing something like a human service chamber? Well, you know, I think uh, quite frankly, we've started by talking to lots of people, talked to lots of organizations. Um, you know, we did a feasibility study. We went out and interviewed people about it. What would they think was important? You know, and there were, there were two things that were one and two in terms of importance, what we heard back uh, from human service organizations. One was advocacy. Advocacy, ad- they wanted somebody to speak for them because sometimes, you know, because they're often in a role where they don't feel like they can speak out. They don't want to endanger their funding, whether it's private funding or public funding. Uh, so they don't feel like they can speak out and an association like a chamber does, you know, speaks out on behalf of its members. The other thing was, I think, in some ways more personal. They wanted a place where they could sort of see each other and talk to each other and share, you know, observations or share experiences or look for more information. You know, there's no need to reinvent things all the time. We could sort of depend on each other in an organization like this to sort of learn from each other. Doing that kind of hard work, uh, there's some power in noticing that everybody is struggling struggling in similar ways, or at least sharing some of that knowledge. I think, yeah, struggling together, sharing together, you know, none of us can be experts in everything. And so I remember back, you know, when I first started doing some of the state policy work, yeah, when the budget would come out, we'd run to the House bill room, get a copy made of it. This is before the computer age. Mm-hmm. And uh, we literally would split up the bill among you know, 15 or 20 of us advocates, and we'd each read a section and then report back on what was in it. What was the, what was the funding levels? What was the statutory language? What yeah. was the temporary language? So, yeah, I mean, I, I, there's a camaraderie that comes from that, a, a shared experience that I think builds um, long-term support. Poverty remains a huge problem in Ohio. Uh, it's something you've been engaged with for many, many years. Mm-hmm. Even when you, you know, in, in your various uh, career moments, when maybe you weren't dealing with poverty directly, poverty was framing a lot of what you would work with. Where do you think Ohio stands with regard to poverty? When do you think about it, you know, with the hindsight and thinking about the, all the experience you've had over the years, where are we and, and, and what are the... The, the areas we need to be really focused on because we can't do everything. So if we can just right. do a couple of things, what would they be? Well, I, I, I'd maybe focus on on two populations first. Uh, I, I'd focus on families with children first. And I think uh, there's two ways that we could help people. Uh, one, we could raise the minimum wage in this state. Um, we have a higher minimum wage than the federal level, higher than a lot of other states. That's but, not saying much, though. <laughs> yes. And I mean, the census data showed that, I mean, I think there were 50,000 Ohioans last year who worked full time and who are still below the poverty level. I mean, that's just not right. Mm-hmm. That, that's not right. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's one thing, raise the minimum wage uh, to a higher level. And two, I think, you know, let's adjust some of our tax policy and stop penalizing, you know, poor working families. We're one of the few states that has an earned income tax credit, a state earned income tax credit that's not refundable. If we could make that refundable, raise the minimum wage, it would also go a long way, I think, towards addressing the benefit cliff. That sort of that scenario that we have now where people are afraid to advance because they don't want to lose their benefits. We've got to tie it to higher wages and, and, and better tax policy for those families. 
I think the other group that we've got to think about, and I'm not sure we have great answers yet, is around older adults. Uh, because, you know, actually child poverty is down from where it was many years ago, but it poverty among the older adults, the aged, has gone up and is continuing to go up. And I think, and I would expect that it's going to continue to go up as, you know, as pensions have disappeared, as, um, you know, the average person, I think, what do they say in their 401k, maybe has 150 or $100,000. Mm-hmm. I mean, you would spend that in one year, more than that, if you were in a nursing home, for example. I mean, it, it just goes so quickly. Um, and for, you know, prescription drugs and things like that. So I think we've got to think about, you know, what can we do in that population? Is it, you know, at the federal level, maybe raising Social Security benefits and, you know, raising the payroll tax um, so that we can afford to do that? I, I don't know, but I, I just, I'm, that's a group I'm worried about because, you know, um, if you think back to the founding of Medicare and Medicaid, you know, well over 50 years ago, you know, I think at the time they realized that wages among older adults are generally much lower. They're not working as much, if at all, and they have many less hours. And so work isn't necessarily the key to this. It may be part of it, you know, more flexibility for older adults around jobs, less, you know, more part-time work and things like that. But those are the two, sort of two populations, and particularly the last one, older adults, because it ties into increased health care costs. Yeah. You know, there was a some research that was done at John Hopkins a few years ago that showed that if you just spent $10 more in SNAP benefits for an older adult, a dual eligible, a low income older adult, you could reduce their time in hospitals and nursing homes and EDs and all that stuff. So maybe there's a way, you know, it's always hard when you save money in one program and spend money in another to try and move dollars because dollars are pretty, not very fungible uh, right. in some of these programs. But I think we've got to try and think about some other approach, I think, for older adults. Yeah, I mean, that sounds so simple. We've talked so many times on this show about policy tweaks that seem, you know, they're pretty easy, actually. But convincing people to look one place and get a benefit in another and and the fact that we actually are living in a dynamic society but budgets don't work in dynamic ways oftentimes and right. territorialism can shut that down quickly i think you're right i think you're right and that's i mean that is the point with a lot of these issues i know you, you and i have talked about you know one of the other things i'm interested in you know the federal government has become seemingly much more open to states uh looking to um you know improve the the health care they provide in their correctional facilities and and letting those people be on medicaid you know we have a federal prohibition you know in the federal law that says if you're incarcerated you know medicaid kind of doesn't turn off but you can't generally can't use it for health care services and they're becoming more flexible on that and that could save money you know, for counties and cities and states right. who spend millions and millions of dollars now on uh, correctional health care. I mean, you just think about it at the state level, how many people, I mean, some of our prisons will come to resemble nursing homes because they'll have so many people who are there for long periods of time right. who get older and get sick. So the health care needs are pretty significant. So it might save some money one place. But then how do you invest that money to maybe kind of close that front door a little bit, yeah. you know, so that people aren't cycling in and out so often? And, you know, this is a, a simmering crisis in the sense that uh, Ohio is an aging state, right? And you just look at the demographics. You know, it's interesting. You talked about families with children and then you talked about older uh, Ohioans, right? And, and it's interesting because, I mean, I teach at a medical school where very few of my students want to go into geriatrics mm-hmm. and, and, and work with – they don't really think about that early on. And yet we have all these students who want to work with kids. And this just shows how we've shaped kind of what where our values are. At the same time, uh, you know, that's not really, really where the action are. I mean, most mm. kids are pretty healthy. But an aging population that luckily our life expectancy is improving. But as it improves, it becomes more complicated and it's a bigger puzzle on the mm. health side. Mm. I, I really um, – I think that that's going to be something our state's going to have to figure out. And also we're going to need more people to – value it. We're going to need more people to look at this population and say, and you mentioned even within a prison, I mean, there it's kind of everywhere and COVID brought some of this out, but right. we're not headed in the right direction there. Right. I, I think you're right. So among other things, you were Medicaid director during the Strickland administration mm-hmm. and since then, we've seen major reforms in Medicaid. We've talked a lot on the show about Medicaid. We've had Lauren Anthes, of course, on to talk and give us his hot takes on Medicaid policy and things like that. 
And this includes the 2014 expansion under Strickland's Republican successor, Governor Kasich. Mm -hmm. It's been a pretty interesting bunch of years. Uh, Community Solutions, of course, is a nonpartisan organization. But it seems to me that Medicaid, despite some really strong Republican opposition early on in the history of the program, has really kind of become less charged in in interesting ways as we start to realize just the benefits of Medicaid to Ohioans in in a very broad way. Do you think that's right? I mean, as as you look back on your years of involvement with Medicaid, are you surprised at its journey? Are you surprised at where we are today? Or does it make sense to you because you're always a believer? I think what has been one of the biggest changes that's occurred in Medicaid that has been, I don't know if surprising, maybe surprising to me, because it's not something that I considered or came up when I was Medicaid director, and that is this sort of movement into the social determinants of health. I don't think when I was Medicaid director, anyone ever used that phrase with me. Um, and that wasn't that long, well, 12 years ago, which yeah. in Medicaid years is probably, you know, a century. But, you know, nobody ever used that phrase with me. And I probably, if someone had, I, I don't know that I would have been open to it, because I would have saw it as, you know, because some people look as at Medicaid. Medicaid is really a financing. It's really about financing. You know, it's, it's financing what you want to do, figure out what you want to do, and then figure out how to get Medicaid to pay for it because the federal government picks up such a significant you know, share of the cost. You know, I always say that you know, when I was Medicaid director, I never met anybody who wanted to spend less. They just wanted to spend it differently. Mm-hmm. Um, they maybe wanted to spend it on providers rather than beneficiaries or on a certain device or a certain drug or a you know, certain you know, site of service or whatever. It, it, nobody ever wanted to spend less. They just wanted to spend it differently. You know, I think we've been really, you know, fortunate um, you know, in the state. We've had a number, I think, of really good leaders you know, of the Medicaid program. Uh, you know, think very highly of John McCarthy, who led it during the Kasich years, and Maureen Corcoran, you know, who leads it now during the DeWine years. So I, I think very highly of both of them. You know, they've both had different focuses, you know, different governors, different focus. You know, I think during the Kasich years, and appropriately so, you know, a lot was focused focused on that expansion group. You know, first it was a hard-fought battle, mm-hmm. you know, to get it through uh, the Ohio, or I should say the Ohio Controlling Board standing in for the Ohio legislature. And and so that was really where the focus was. And they just started to kind of get into the behavioral health area with behavioral health redesign. You know, I think when De- w- Governor DeWine was elected and came in, you know, he really signaled that, that children were going to be a primary focus. And so we have the development of Ohio Rise, you know, a program for kids with really sort of severe, you know, behavioral health challenges and issues. Uh, and also, um, you know, this whole movement into social determinants that didn't, you know, exist before. And a real, I think, you know, reorienting, you know, managed care, you know, as I think, you know, the governor would always say, I want it to be, you know, the business of people, not the business of managed care. Mm-hmm. And I think they've tried to do that with how they've redesigned the program. I think a good example of that, yeah, one of the things I always tell people too is, you know, if you're in these kind of roles, you have to be um, comfortable with knowing the fact that the next person may undo what you did because they have different, you know, a different set of values or a different set of beliefs or different, you know, different uh, prerogatives or whatever. So, you know, when I was there, you know, I took the pharmacy benefit out of managed care and put it back in fee-for-service because providers told me they couldn't cope with five different formularies and five different insurance plans. Yeah. Uh, the case of years, they put it back into managed care. So we went back in the the direction. The DeWine administration kind of split the difference. Put it back into managed care, but one managed care plan. Right. So all your, the far, you know, so it makes it easier, I think, for prescribers and patients and stuff. So, you know, there's more than one way to, to do something down here. And uh, there are a lot of moving parts, but in general, the program, I, I remember, you know, during the campaign years uh, when, when Governor DeWine was seeking office, you know, there was always that moment of sort of what's his overall position going to be on Medicaid? Mm-hmm. Is he going to continue the K6 sort of general? I mean, Governor Kasich called it a, the expansion, a matter of life and death, and, 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 and as you noted, really fought for that. But of course, Governor DeWine looked at the ledgers and looked at the overall picture and decided that you really can't go all in on children and families and, you know, and push Medicaid to the side. It's become so central to what we do. I always try to look for moments of bipartisan possibility, and, and it seems like Medicaid routinely people are looking at it and finding, yeah, maybe something a little different than somebody else in it, but finding something for themselves to accomplish their end goals of, you know, I don't know, 
re- reducing infant mortality or something like that. I think you know, med- you know, one of the benefits of the Medicaid program, and there are many, is that it is so flexible. You know, it is a state federal partnership, and so both parties, you know, have a role to play in figuring out how the program might work. You know, it's it's not maybe as rigid as Medicare is, where it's all sort of federally controlled. It's controlled by both states uh, and and by the federal government. You know, and the and the I think the other thing is you, we just can't overlook. I mean, the value to the economy. I mean, I just saw today that, you know, on a per capita basis for every Ohioan in the state, there's $2,200 of federal Medicaid money that flows into the state. Mm. 79 cents out of every federal grant dollar we get from the federal government is Medicaid. So we're talking about billions of dollars, puts a lot of people to work, provides a lot of care, and it's not a program we should turn our back on. So I promise not to embarrass you too much by making this into a kind of end of career fest shrift or something like that. But I have you here, so I, I can't miss the opportunity to at least do a little reflecting, um, not only on your years of work with Community Solutions, but at Metro Health, State of Ohio as Medicaid director and, 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 and other things. When you think back to where you began your work in health, let's say generally, you know, are we where you thought we would be as a state. I mean, did, did you have loftier goals? Did you have specific outcomes that you thought really we, we can attain that, that we haven't? And I guess on the flip side, not to be glass half empty about things, what are, what are some areas where you say, you know, I really, I really can't believe we haven't been able to, you know, do X, Y, or Z? Yeah. I think generally, uh, things are much better in many ways, particularly around coverage. You know, we've been able to reduce the uninsured, uh, you know, to its lowest level. I think this, I mean, we'll see if it pops up after this last year's census data, but I mean, it's, that's pretty extraordinary. I mean, cause that seemed like a insurmountable problem, uh, before the passage of the Affordable Care Act in Ohio, implementing expansion and the exchanges, things like that, and some of the other, you know, rules that have been put in place. Now we could do more. We could increase subsidies for people in the exchange and bring more people in to get covered and stuff. So I think that's, you know, really been really important. I think we've also, you know, we've made real progress in reducing child poverty, particularly if you look at the supplemental measures, despite kind of the blip up this year because of the elimination of the child tax credit. I think we've made real, you know, progress there. I also think, you know, the state in terms of its schools, one of the things that Governor Taft started when he was here was the building of new schools in the state. I mean, you know, I remember seeing the documentaries here in Ohio about the condition of schools in the state, and they were pretty shocking. So I think we've done a lot to address that. But the issues that sort of still hang out for me that I, you know, I, I wish we could do more about, you know, one is around just, you know, some of those things I talked about earlier, you know, really rewarding work, you know, and not just, not a buzzword, but, you know, what can we do, like, particularly early care and education? Mm-hmm. You know, I'm concerned now that we seem to be kind of losing our momentum, you know, in that space. And, uh, it's just, I, I, I think there are a few things as important as, as making sure children have access to a high quality early learning experience when they're young. It just has such significant dividends for kids. And then a totally different subject, I'd say, you know, I, I'm still discouraged. Uh, you know, I'm, you know, I, I graduated from Ohio University in 1981. And uh, it was like the month after I graduated from OU um, that I saw the first article in the New York Times about HIV, uh, except they didn't call it then back then. Yeah. And, um, you know, I wish we could do more to reduce infections in the state because we know how to do it. You know, and I think that's where a partnership between like Medicaid and the Ohio Department of Health and others could maybe push that along so we could drive down infections uh, uh, in the state because, you know, we're st- I still think we're in the range of, you know, 800 to 1,000 new cases every year. Yeah. And, and, nobody, and you never hear about it. No, no. It's it's really just sort of because people think, well, there's medication. But, I mean, there's some personal costs that are involved, you know, with when people get HIV. But there's also, I mean, each one, every, they all eventually add up on Medicaid, you know, probably at a cost of a half, a, you know, a half a million dollars, you know, or maybe more. Uh, so it's expensive, and it's also it's just from a human standpoint, it's just it's just unfortunate. So those are two, you know, the, and and I guess maybe the last one is sort of it's sort of also interesting to me as somebody who started their career working for Planned Parenthood that we're back where we were, you know, so many years later that I didn't expect, you know, that we'd be having this debate, you know, yeah. over Roe versus Wade again. 
happens. So, And of course, sitting here in September, we have a huge thing coming up in November. I mean, Ohio also stands to kind of shock the country, uh, it really, could, yeah, you know, it could. depending on which way the election goes in right. November. Yeah. Um, and, and I think we can't underestimate how big that is in terms of the broader, uh, I mean, just for a long time that I've lived in Ohio, I've kind of felt... Like I've been watching our our swing state status, or the national interest in this mm-hmm. state kind of wane. Whereas mm-hmm. you, you know, people used to be really interested in the political dynamic here because it was a bellwether. Yeah, and I think November kind of puts that spotlight back on. Yeah, it probably does that. You know, we've been thinking about it in sort of a broader way. You know, trying to understand. You know, if yeah, you know, let's say the voters you know turn it down and a. Abortion becomes illegal in Ohio. Trying to understand what that means for our health and human services mm-hmm. system. You know, what does that mean to our child welfare agencies? What does that mean to our domestic violence programs? All of our programs, you know, that work with women and families will get impacted by that. And, um, it's, it's, you know, I think those are the kind of conversations that we have to have because, you know, we can't assume, you know, that the things will kind of fix themselves. So. Yeah. I mean, it's something that certainly I've seen community solutions do and some of the partners you work with is preparing for both eventualities and pivotal moments like this, because if your focus is on people, then you need to protect people. You need to prepare to protect people either way it goes. And, and, and that's, that's what the human services sector does. Yeah. I think, I mean, yeah, I think we try and stay out of the ideological fights and, and focus more on the practical and Mm -hmm. sort of, okay, this is what we have. So, how do we deal with what we have? Because that's what people have to deal with. They, they don't have, people don't have time for ideology. You know, they've got to live their lives in the here and now and deal with what is. So last question, you know, um, you are stepping down as uh, after leading community solutions for, for uh, how many years? Uh, well, nine years as, uh, as the boss, so to yeah. speak, uh, and then nine years before that as a senior fellow. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, retirement can be a kind of laden thing, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of reflecting and all of that. But, you know, I want to I want to ask you, you know, I, I work with medical students, but I also get lots of calls from people who are, you know, activists and advocates and they want to know – how they can, you know, contribute meaningfully to the state. And frankly, sometimes uh, I hear uh, the sense that there's just nothing that anybody can do, this kind of sense of hopelessness. And I know that's not true because I can point them to people who do this work and, and really make a difference. But what's your pitch? You know, um, it, when as you talk to younger folks who are trying to figure out, hey, I want to do this kind of work. I want to be involved in, in the human services sector or I want to advocate for X, Y, or Z. Mm-hmm. What do you tell them, and, and and how do you make the case that you know Ohio is worth fighting for? Well, I you know I'm an optimist. You know, uh, in in through all these years, I've always been an optimist. I've always felt like you can change things or, or make and make a difference. That doesn't mean we always win. We don't. <laughs> we lose a fair amount, uh, but we win sometimes. And you know, like I think about you know, uh, let's think about Medicaid expansion in the state. I'm not sure that I would have thought uh, when uh, Governor Kasich defeated Governor Strickland in that election that Governor Kasich would go on to bring forth Medicaid expansion. Mm-hmm. I d- that I don't I don't think I thought that, and so I think that's the other thing is is we can't. I, I think it's really dangerous to kind of prejudge people and sort of feel like oh, well this is where they're going to be um, because every issue is different, if people's experiences are different. And I, I think if we can, you know, keep that open mind, uh, being willing to engage in conversation because, you know, certainly as Medicaid director, I talked to lots of people who disagreed with me. Mm-hmm. Um, I bet. And uh, there's value in that. There's just value in that conversation because you may learn something about the other person that may be valuable in, in a future conversation about something else. And, and certainly the Obama years and then the Trump years have created these divisions and made political conversation difficult for many people. I think mm-hmm. it's it's really destroyed a lot of families, frankly, and and friendships have been um, you know put under uh, incredible pressure. But when you look at something like you know Governor Kasich and um, and Medicaid expansion, or just think about the ways in which pragmatic problem solving during the pandemic needed to be done. You know, I mean, that's the great hope. The the great hope is that you don't need to have some idea in your mind that you're a pro this candidate or pro that can- it's really about just can we actually move to these evidence-based uh, practices or do the best we can 
that's where my focus is, is on training students to stay out of the nonsense. Yeah. You know, there are so many fights that just kind of suck us down rabbit holes that are totally unproductive. And uh, these kind of conversations, I think, are the things that actually get us where we need to go. I think the areas where we can develop consensus are the areas where it's the most long lasting, because if there isn't consensus around it, when the other side comes in, they'll just they'll get rid of it they'll just they'll throw it away but but if you got consensus or have some consensus with sort of both sides of the aisle so to speak i think it has a better chance to be long lasting well john i want to thank you again for you know your years and years of service to the state and 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 really people like you have been the engine um but because you keep at it and you keep building partnerships and coalitions and lifting up people who need to be lifted up. So I uh, appreciate you taking some time to chat about all this and um, looking forward to seeing you thrive in, in the next phase. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. This episode was produced by me, Dan Skinner. I received engineering support from Mike Foley at WCBE and video support from the AV Whizzes at Columbus City Schools, the latter of which you can check out in our social media and YouTube channels. I'm thrilled to have some social media and other production support from the super talented Nathaniel Powell. Prognosis Ohio is a member of the WCB Podcast Experience and the Health Podcast Network. As always, be in touch if you have ideas for guests, topics, or ways we can improve the show. Speaking of improving the show, to do that, we need your support. So please consider chipping in through our Patreon site, which is linked from prognosisohio.com. Even if you can't or just won't, please tell your friends about the show. That really helps us. Stay tuned as well for our next episode in which I talk with former director of the Ohio Department of Health, Dr. Amy Acton. It's going to be a great episode. Be well and thanks for listening.